Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. You guys know for the past several weeks that we've been uh, discussing different matters related to the home and the family. Family as we know it, obviously we, we know is under attack in this nation and in this, society, uh, in this society. It seems like judges in this country keep changing or trying to change what marriage is. Federal judges, you know, believe that they, can just, that they actually know more than the God of the Bible, right? They think that they're better than God, and they think, that, you know, that's what they're getting through. But the thing, let me tell you this, is, is the fact that they can think that they're better than God, and they, you know, and, and they think that they know better than, you know, marriage just being between one man and one woman. But you know what? God knows better, than, you know, than all of us. He's obviously the ultimate judge, and they will meet, uh, you know, those judges will meet him one day, Right? Because, you know, we know that the Word of God is clear-cut and, uh, you know, gives clear-cut commands on what marriage is and the family. And so, this morning, I want to look at, a, uh, I want to look at one of the most important areas of all. And that is raising children in the will of God for His glory. When we have successfully raised our children, we have accomplished something of the highest magnitude. And so if you're in Deuteronomy chapter 6, we're going to start at verse 1, going through 9, is this. The Bible reads, Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments, which the Lord your God commanded to teach you, that ye may know know them in the land, whither ye go to possess it, that thou mightest fear of the Lord thy God, to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy son's uh, son, all the days of thy life, and... uh, uh, and that thy days may be prolonged. Hear therefore, uh, hear therefore, O Israel, and observe, observe to do it. That is, may it be well with thee, and that ye may, uh, ye may uh, increase mightily, as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee in the land that flows with milk and honey. Verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord of thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And all these, all these words, or, and these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk, uh, talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest in the way, uh, by the way. And when thou liest down, and when thou arisest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon uh, thy hand. And they, uh, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy door, or of thy house, and of thy gates. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the word. Lord, I ask that you would fill me with your spirit this morning. Lord, I, I pray that we not just be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. Lord, I pray that, you know, that the seed of your word would fall upon fertile soil. Lord, that you would give me of boldness to preach your word, that it would be as a fire shut up in my bones, and I would convey your truth in Jesus' name. Amen. And so one of the things that, you know, oftentimes, you know, people are asked, you know, is, what is your greatest accomplishment in life? And people, you know, some people may say their job, they may say all these different things in life, but, the th- you know, they may say, you know what, um, I, I have a successful, you know, like I said, a successful business. I, I have a lot of friends. I, you know, I have a lot of friends on Facebook or whatever it is. I mean, if you, sorry, that's not really an accomplishment, sorry, on, on Facebook. But some, well, some would actually uh, consider that to be an accomplishment. But, you know, the thing is, is that if we ultimately looked at it uh, and we can come back and say, my greatest accomplishment is that my children still want to come see me after all these years, that's a good thing, isn't it? That's a great thing, that if your kids still want to come see you after all that, right? When everything else in life is weighed and considered in light, uh, in light of its importance, there is no greater uh, ministry than that is given to parents. Do you realize, parents, that your kids are your ministry? It is, uh, it is, it is uh, of great importance. It is one of the greatest investments that we can ever make. The Bible is clear that when it comes to ch- uh, when it reminds us of children as a precious gift of God, it says this in Psalm one twenty seven. It says, "Lo, children are a heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is His reward." As arrows are in the hand of a mi- uh, of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his fi- uh, his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed. But, uh, 
but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Far too often, children are looked at as what? They're looked at as being an inconvenience or a, you know, a, a nuisance, right? That they're looked at. I'm thankful for all the kids in the service. You, somebody said, man, it's chaotic and there are so many kids. I'm thankful that there are kids in here. Why? That's the next generation. And they get to hear the word of God just like anybody else. And so, you know, I'm thankful. And so, so before we, you know, we're, you know, we're quick to sit there and go, you know what, man, there's a lot of kids. I, I, I enjoy them. I enjoy it in here. Now, I may have to get a little louder at times, but that's okay. I'm fine with that. But we always must remember that God has placed our, uh, that our children have been placed in our lives for just a few short years. I mean, think about it. I think about it the other, I mean, I was thinking about it the other day. That it just seemed like yesterday, and, and you know, people are like, man, you're old, as soon as you start making those statements. But it just seems like yesterday we were bringing Lily home from the hospital. That's the way it seems, that, that how fast time flies in life. And now all of a sudden she's 10, and, you know, and she reminds me, Dad, in a few months I'm going to be 11. I'm like, okay, slow down. Slow it down. They have been obviously given to us so that we, uh, that we might... Help them to mature into, the, uh, into adults that God desires them to be, right? We want them to be all that God would have for us. And you say, well, that's a big task, and I don't know if I can do it. God has equipped you. For one thing, he's given you his word, which is your instruction manual on how to do it, right? We are not gui- uh, we're not guilty of, you know, hope- hopefully we're not going to be guilty of forcing them into our mold of like, what we want them to be. Just because, you know, uh, you know, maybe life passed us by and we didn't get to do what we wanted to do does not mean we should force kids into being what we want them to be, right? That we should nurture what they would, uh, that, you know, what they would have to be. That we should do everything in our, pow- you know, in our power to mold them into the image of Christ. This passage obviously gives us some much needed insights into the matter of raising our kids. So this morning I want to talk to you about parenting by the book. Parenting by the book. Number one is this, parents must live right. Parents must live right. We see this in the first three verses. Successful parenting also, you know, uh, uh, always begins with a parent's relationship with God. No parent can ever succeed in helping their child grow in the image of the Lord unless they know the Lord. If you don't know the Lord, you can't help your child to grow in the Lord, right? Parents must be walking in a right relationship before God or they will never influence, they have the influence in their children's lives that is needed. In other words, you will never be able to lead your children somewhere that you have never been. You will, you will never be able to lead your children where you've never been. If, you've never, if, you, if you're not growing in the Lord, you can't lead them to a deeper relationship in the Lord. You need to be growing in the Lord as far as reading His Word and, and coming to church and, and all those things. So in the first, the first few verses... It speaks of this issue and shows parents where they need to be if they are going to be effective parents that God desires them to be. One of the things he talks about is he speaks about reverence. He speaks about reverence, right? We're told in verse 2 that we should fear the Lord. That we should fear the Lord. That is, that we are to walk in awareness of his glory, of his holiness, and his majesty. That a parent's primary responsibility is to walk in the fear of the Lord. The Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and understanding. If we don't walk in the fear of the Lord, if we don't understand that, then you know what? We're not going to be able to teach our kids. How many of you want to be able to understand what God would have for you, but also you want to be able to understand and be able to give that to your kids? Right? Right? But remember, if you're not reading his word, whatever you've never read, you're never going to be able to teach them. But what you have taught, you know, you have learned, you can teach them. We are to bring, we are to bring our lives under God's lordship. We are to say, you know what, God, whatever your word says, that's what I'm going to do. That's what I need to do. A godly parent places God's will above all other consideration, recognizing that the fear of the Lord is the first step, like I said, in wisdom and in proper parenting. One of the other things he, uh, you know, I notice here is that he speaks about reactions. He speaks about reactions, and this is the big, you know, big thing, is that when we fear the Lord as we should, we should obey his word, right? There's no better witness uh, to our children than the sure knowledge that mom and dad take the Bible seriously. If you don't take the Bible seriously, they won't take it seriously. 
If you don't take God's word seriously, if you don't believe it, you don't want to, I'm not saying you've got to be perfect in it because you know, nobody's perfect. But I'm saying if you show your kids you're serious, they will take it seriously. And what else, the other part is, is that you, uh, they need to realize that God's word is the rule of the home. That how, we, uh, how you follow, you know, how you live your life at home, how you, how you teach them and show them at home is through that the word of God is the rule. So this obviously brings some, you know, to me some great truths that God's standards are to be our standards, right? God's standards are to be our standards. That we are to build our lives around the word of God when God speaks we are to respond by doing what he tells us to do and by refraining from those uh, things he, tell, he tells us not to do, right? If God says, don't do this, should we do it? Now, I found out something very, uh, very uh, insightful this past weekend, that whenever you tell Doc not to do something or touch something, Doc's going to go touch it or do it. <laughs> right, Doc? We went by, and there was this, as we're walking by, there's this, like, blue plastic thing coming on the ground. And it says, do not touch. <laughs> Doc goes by, and he goes. And I was like, it says, do not touch. And he, he just goes over, and, just, and just, like, just taps it. We're like, all right. That's why we never give Doc a big red button that says, do not push, because he would go like that and just push it right away just to see what it does. Sorry, Doc. I had to use that one. You just want to find out what's going on, right? Your children often, often model what they see in your life. This is a, a harsh reality for parents to realize that what your, what your kids see in you and, see, and, and what you do, they will do. And here's the thing. Oftentimes, the things that frustrate you about your kids, I want you to you know, listen to this. Often the things that frustrate you about your children is what you have already showed them to do. You know the whole saying, a monkey see, monkey do? Well, look in the mirror, monkey. <laughs> Whatever they see you do, however that you, you react, they're going to react that way. Right? I'm not going to get an amen on that one because like, I'm not going to admit anything to that because my kids are doing things I never told them to do. No, they've seen it in your life, and they model it. It's our responsibility, obviously, to teach them that God's word is to be obeyed. Also in this portion of Scripture, the first three verses, it speaks about rewards. God promises Israel that when they followed his word, what, did, what would he do? That he would bless them and that he would reward them. I mean, think about it. That's what you do with your children. That if your kids, I mean, are you going to reward your kids for bad behavior? I mean, there's a reward. It's not the one that you like, though, usually when you disobey your parents, right? But when, you, when your kids are obeying, they're following you, they're like, yes, ma'am, no, sir, you know, whatever, and they're following and they're doing what you ask them to do with no kind of talking back to you, what do you want to do? You want to reward them, right? We see this in, you know, in Psalm chapter one, uh, 1 where it says that children need to, see, uh, need to see that God will do what he says he will do. If God says he's going to do something, God's going to do it, right? Do your children, do your children know that, that God will bless tithing? Do your children know that, you know that God will bless tithing? Do they know that? Have you taught them that? Have you showed that in their, uh, in their life? Is that when you tithe, that God blesses you, so you want to teach that to them? Well, that's one of the things, like, um, you know, I know that this, uh, the past couple of weeks, you know, my daughter's been, you know, uh, helping out, um, and, you know, uh, helping out, and she's been making money. And she thought it was kind of unfair at first that, you know, that God's going to take 10% of it, you know, her money. I said, God's not going to take it. You're just going to, you know, freely give it because we want you to understand that God is going to bless you because you've done it. And it's something that, you know, is, it, it, it seems backwards even to an adult you're like you're telling me that i can do more with 90 percent by you know 90 percent and giving god 10 percent than i can with the whole 100 percent yes does it seem backwards yes but you know what it works i mean that's what his word says that he's gonna do do your children know that that god will bless honesty that when you're honest what is god gonna do he's gonna bless you for it i i've always you know i've always taught my daughter and you know 
that if you tell me the truth, I mean, you may be in trouble, but if you tell me the truth, the punishment will be far less than if you lie to me. And she's found that to be true, you know, you know on, on several occasions where, you know, now she just says, hey, Dad, you know, this is what's going on. She's, been more tr- she's being more truthful about those things. Do you know your kids? Do you know uh, uh, children see that faithfulness to God is blessed as well? That if you're faithful, that God is going to bless you for it. Or do your kids, let me ask this question. Do your children see serving God as optional or mandatory? Do you see... Do your kids see that serving God is optional or mandatory? They need, uh, they need to learn exactly what, uh, what they are to observe in life. They need to know that God blesses faithful people. If they see uh, us enjoying the great blessings of God, they will want to, uh, to see the same things in their own life, won't they? I mean, let's, let's show them that, uh, that serving uh, you know, God is the only way to live that ob- and that obedience to the Lord is, uh, always pays off. Let's show them that, that God's way is the best way. It is far better to raise a religious fanatic zealot than it is a heathen. Right? When your parenting du- duties are over, in which they never are, because, you know, some people say, well, when my kids turn 18, no, the parenting doesn't stop at age 18. It goes on. <laughs> but your children will see how you live your life. And you know what? That investment that you put in, eventually, you're going to see that, you know, the fruit of your investment. And by the way... You can't show the kids, you know, to be faithful. You can't show them all these things if all you do is complain about the church. All you do is complain about the pastor and the way that things are done at, Lord's, at the Lord's house. Because if you complain about it, that's what they're going to do. And they're not going to want to, I mean, who wants to be around, you know, something that causes complaints? Right? You can't, you know, teach them to honor the Lord if you don't honor them. You can't teach them to be faithful if you're not faithful. You can't teach them to love the Lord if all you do is encourage them to love the world. Let me say that again. If you can't, if you can't teach them to love the Lord, but, but you want to encourage them to love the world, there's going to be a problem, don't you think? Some of us have, you know, oftentimes say, you know, I don't understand my child. I don't understand it. I bring them to church once a week. I mean, I'm there, I'm faithful. What are you teaching them throughout the week? I mean, if you came to Sunday school, you know, this morning, and, and, and you're here, that's like two hours. But there's 24 hours in a day, and we have seven days a week, don't we? So number one, we saw that, you know, the parents must live right. That seems kind of like, uh, that seems kind of like duh, doesn't it? That if you want your kids, you know, to live right, you have to live right. This is not a do as I say, you know, do as I say, not as I do statement. Far too many parents, I mean, I always love this one. When I was a kid, actually, actually, you know what, that's not true. I hated this, this answer when I was a kid. I'm like, why? Because I said so. I hated that one as a kid, but I, I, I came around to it as an adult, and now I love it. But then I also said, you know what, I have to explain why I do. Because there's a reason why they're asking you why, because they legitimately want to know why. It may take you a moment and say, give me a moment, because right now I'm a little frazzled and everything else by what you did, but I need to, you know, and I'll tell you why. But you know what? I, I, I enjoyed the, the whole because I said so, but then I also figured out that I was making my daughter, you know, more angry, you know, when I would say that. So it wasn't doing well. But number two is, parents, you must love right. You must love right. Verses four and five. Uh, we see this is that, again, that this, you know, may not seem, you know, a lot to do with parenting, but it, it strikes at the very heart that if we're not loving right, we're not going to be able to love our kids right. We're not going to be able to love the Lord right. Before we can be success, a, a successful Christian parents, we must have our own relationship with God nailed down. Just as it is important that our kids see us living right, they must also see us loving right. That is, they must see that we love the Lord God supremely above all things, that God is number one in our life. 
If the kids, you know, uh, uh, begin to see that there are other things more important than church, more other things that are more important than God, that's what they're going to place. They say, "Well, mom and dad don't, you know, find it important." That's why I appreciate it when uh, parents actually bring their kids to church that they don't just drop them off. It's important for the kids to see that mom and dad are like, yeah, well, yeah, go to the church. They'll babysit you for an hour or two while I go do something. It's not, kids need to see that it's important to you as well. Because all they're going to do is go and, you know, come into church and cause a problem because you're like, well, I shouldn't be here because my parents aren't even here. Right? In verse 4, we see that our love is to be focused on the Lord, that there are to be no other gods in our life. Too often, kids see parents putting everything in the world ahead of God. It may be the fact of their job. It may be a hobby. It may be a friend. Whatever, whatever comes ahead of God in our life is an idol. And it sends a, a, a bad message to our kids. That when we put other things in front of God, it sends a very bad image to them. What we're doing is that we're telling them by our actions that this thing that we love comes ahead of our love for God. That ki- you know, and kids need to know that no one or, or nothing comes before our relationship with God. He must be our focus. If we teach them that God is just for Sundays, we are going to raise a generation of infidels. We're going to raise a generation of heathens. Oftentimes people say, well, why did my child reject the faith as soon as they turned 18? This would be one of the reasons why. Is the, the reason lies in the fact that when what mom and dad claim, uh, to, have, uh, you know, claim to have believed, they actually don't because by the way they, they live. And by the way, if it weren't for the intervention of God in my life, I, you know, you guys know this, that I would not be standing before you this morning. We need to have people that are praying for those. We need to have parents praying for their children as well. Number two, uh, that parents must love right, is that our love is to be fixed on the Lord. The love for God is to motivate us in every area of our life. Everything that we do in life should be for His glory. That if we say, you know what, whatever I'm doing now, how can I bring God glory in this situation? You say, I, I don't understand how to do that. Well, if you, oftentimes we need to get off our phones long enough to actually think about it. Most of the time what ends up happening is that we're so focused on our phones that we don't think about anything anymore. Because, hey, that phone, it's got cool graphics and pretty colors. And they got the latest trends and all sort of stuff. We got, you know, TikTok and these short little videos and, you know, our, like... I'm not even talking about kids' attention, uh, you know, attention spans because they're, they're, they're smaller. I understand that. But parents are getting that way too. Why? Because they see all these short videos and all that kind of stuff on there. And it just, am I saying that you should like all of a sudden just become Amish? No. I'm saying the thing is that you know, it would do well for us to get off our phones you know, a, a little bit. That if we get home from work, that we just say, you know what, I'm going to be here. I'm going to be present at home instead of on my phone or on the TV. Our love for uh, our love for us, uh, or sorry, our love for Him should consume us. When it does, it, it will fill us. It will work in us, and it will reveal, uh, reveal itself through us. When we love Him like we should, we will be in our place at church time every single time. Right? We will support the work of the church, and we, you know, with our giving and our living and our in our time, we will turn. Uh, we will teach. Our children to be faithful to the things of God, not to personal opinion. You, oftentimes, kids are told today, whatever feels good, that's what you're supposed to do. And that's what's going to get you in trouble. Because there are things that feel good that are not good. Just because it feels good does not mean it's right. We should teach them to respect church, the people of God, and, and the men of God. We should teach them to love the Word of God, worship, as we did this morning, and the will of God. That the will of God is not some sort of burden that we go, oh man, well God's going to ask me to go to Africa. Because automatically, somebody thinks that if they all of a sudden, you know, actually get excited for the Lord and begin reading His Word, that God's going to send them off to Africa. I don't know what it is about Africa that, you know, most people think that's where God's going to send them. Like, is that like Timbuktu? Actually, there is Timbuktu in Africa, but 
Just because you get excited for the Lord does not mean he's, he's going to ship you off to some country that you've never heard, and you know, all of a sudden you're going to become a, uh, like a missionary, you're going to begin to do things that you hate. Our children need to see the fact that we actually, that we actually love the things of God and not despise the things of God, right? So number one, we saw the parents must love, or sorry, must live right. Number two was the parents must love right. And number three is that parents must learn right. They must learn right. In verses 6 through 9, these verses, you know, uh, uh, reveals, uh, uh, sorry, it reveals what Moses is saying about the Word of God and its importance in successful parenting. We are to take the Word of God and make it mandatory, a mandatory, uh, sorry, the primary motivator in all that we do as parents. Moses mentions three things that we are to do with the Word of God. He says that we are to study it. This is not something that we just kind of pick up, we read a couple of passages, and then we're done. We're actually supposed to study it. And he said, well, you know what? When I graduated high school, I don't need to study anymore. If that's your, your thought process, I'm sorry. You're going to conti- Hopefully, you continue to learn. you got to continue to learn for your job, or else you're going to be stuck in the same spot in your job you know, for the rest of your life. The same thing is, you know, you know, with the Word of God, that when we study it, you know, that we need to realize that we need to take it in and allow it to change our lives. Because if you study something, for, you know, for your job, how many, how many of you know that if you study for something for your job and they say you need to do this, it's going to change your life? Why? Because most likely you're going to get a promotion. When you, when you read the Word of God and you apply it to your life and you allow it to change you, it will change you. It will change you. The Word of God is not something that if you read it, all of a sudden it, 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 it just takes over you and says, you're going to change no matter what. I don't care. But when you allow it to change your life, it will change your life. If I, if I expect my life to impact my children, then I must be transformed by the Word of God itself. Nothing can happen through me until it first happens. In, 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 oh, sorry, nothing can happen through me until it first happens in me. Kids will not begin to, you know, to see those things in my life if I haven't allowed it to change it, you know, change it in my life. It is essential that parents have their own personal time of prayer and Bible study. You say, you know, I don't have time to have my own time of, of prayer and Bible study. This is something that's going to be uncomfortable. So parents, I want you to look up here. If you say you don't have any time you know, uh, to study God's word and to do all those things, I'm going to you know, say something right now and you're going to be like, Pastor, I don't like you anymore. Is the fact that you need to get up earlier. You need to, you know, you need to find that time of the day where, you know what, the kids are not, you know, either asleep or playing or at school or doing something else so that way you have that time for yourself. You know why? Because if you're running on empty... You're going to take it out on your kids. You're not going to be able to, you know, to, to, to uh, uh, give them back the love of Christ when you, have no lo- you don't have the Word of God in you. If you don't have the Word of God in you, you can't sit there and say, you know what, I'm going to tell you about Jesus. Because you're running on empty. How far does your car go when it hits E? How far does it go? Nowhere. And that's where you're going to take your kids nowhere. If you, if you don't study God's word, you don't take it in, uh, you know, in, into your life. And so that you, that only, that's not only for the fact of being at home. It also means that on Sunday morning, you may have to get up a little bit earlier. You say, well, I'm already here at service. Well, we do have Sunday school. We also do have breakfast time. You say, well, I get breakfast at home. But it's a little bit different when you're able to fellowship with fellow, uh, fellow believers, right? And if you've had a hard week, you may want to talk to that person and say, you know, I've had a hard week, and they may be able to help you. That's why the Bible says, you know, as iron sharpens iron. We're supposed to sharpen one another. How many of you know that mom and dad still need to grow in Jesus Christ? And kids, I want you to realize this as well. Your parents are not perfect. That might be a shocking revelation for you, but your parents, your grandparents, whoever, you know, comes in, you know, whatever adult comes in your life, they're not perfect. I know that you think mom and dad are like, oh man, they're amazing. They just, they just glide into the room all the time and then whatever. And they say, go do this. And it's like, 
Uh, oh, that is the word for my mom and dad. I shall do it. Because mom and dad know that that doesn't happen all the time. The second thing, uh, the second uh, area where the parents must learn, right, is that we need to share it. We need to share it. This verse says that we are to diligently teach the word to our, chil- uh, to our children, that we are to teach them. So when I say we, does that mean that the, it's the pastor's responsibility to teach them? It's your job. Yes, I, am I saying, hey, it's a bad thing to come to church? No, because we all come to church because we want to hear from the word of God, right? But it is our job to teach them because if we're not teaching them throughout the week, who else is teaching them? Most likely, it's not the parents. It may be TV, it may be, you know, the teachers at school, it may be, and not, and I, I've had people say, you know, come up and say, why, are you, why do you talk against, like, public schools? Because not every teacher at public schools is a believer. And they will teach your children stuff that they believe, which goes against the Word of God. So it is our job as parents to say, you know what, I'm going to teach my child what the Word says so that way when you know, a teacher or a student comes out against the Word of God, they know that that's a lie and they know what God's Word says. Like when they go into biology class, they're going, you know what, this evolution stuff is stupid. I believe that God created us, right? And they know that. They don't have to come home and be like, Mom, Dad... Our grandma and grandpa, are they monkeys? You don't have to have that conversation because they automatically know that that's stupid. Mom and dad, they're not monkeys, right? That word, uh, that word diligently means to wet or to sharpen. It carries the idea of, of a stabbing or or one object penetrating another. In other words, our training is to penetrate deeply into our children. We are to help them on the basis of, uh, on the basis of God's word to sharpen them uh, and, and discern so that everything that we teach them comes to life to them. That we are to, uh, we are to not teach them through dogmatic, explana- uh, you know, uh, dogmatic statements of because I said so. I talked about that earlier is the fact that because I said so does not mean. I mean, if we come over there and say, hey, you know what? You shouldn't do this. You shouldn't do that. You shouldn't do this. And if a child says, you know, a child says, why? If our answer is because I said so, usually what happens with a child? They give you an eye roll and they don't listen to you anymore. But if you come up and you're teaching them, you know, what the word of God says and you're sharing it with them and you explain to them, hey, why is it? That marriage is between one man and one woman. You say, you know what? Because that's the way that God has, has designed it. You don't have to go into some deep theological you know, uh, you know, uh, understanding of it. You say, you know what? This is what God said. God says that man and woman are to marry, not anything else. Right? That we are to develop in them a set of convictions. You know the thing is, is that when they go off to school, if they have their own convictions, they're not going to be swayed by everybody else. If they already know what the Word of God says because you've taught them at home, it's not, uh, they're going to be able to influence their friends instead of their friends influencing them. They're going to be able to be the leader around that school instead of being a follower of everybody else's like false teaching. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11, it shows us three ways that we are to influence our children. It says, as ye know how we exhorted and comforted, and charged every one of you as a father does his children. That word exhort me, uh, you know, literally means to call to one side. It speaks of the fact of encouraging your child. You take your child around, you know, you put your arm around your child, and you begin to teach them and show, you know what, that you care, that you're showing them that the convictions that they are to possess at that moment. You are to, uh, you, you do this by consistently loving and living, and if you live one way and try to push them in another way, you're going to fail, right? If you try to push them in the way that they don't want to go, if you see somebody that's really good with their hands, like your, your child's good, you know, say good at woodworking, but you're saying, no, you're not going to do woodworking, you're going to be a baseball player. Don't you think your child's going to push against you? 
You should say, you know what, maybe they don't like sports. I'm going to go over here and we're going to try and teach them how to do some woodworking, right? That word in their uh, comfort literally means to encourage. As parents, we are to seek to bring out the best in our children by encouraging them in the things uh, they do correctly and in the things they do well. Oftentimes, as parents, we like to point out everything that our child does wrong and say, you know what, don't do that. Don't do it. Get over here. Stop that. Do this. But what we need to do is actually encourage them and say, you know what, you did awesome there. That was great. This is wonderful in what you're doing. Then we are to charge. It says that we are to uh, charge them, which means to call a witness or um, that as parents, that there are times when we cannot condone everything. I've heard people say, you know what, whatever my child does, I'll just love them. So if your child wanders on a, bu- you know, on a busy highway, you're just going to say, I'm just going to let them go. I love them so much, I'm going to let them get hit by a semi, right? You're not going to do that. Nobody's going to sit there and do that. You don't condone everything that your kid does. You are to teach them, right? You are to teach them right from wrong, of things that they, they should do and that they shouldn't do. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6 says this, Train up a child in the way that, they sh- uh, that he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. What does it mean by train up? We are to literally train our kids to do those things. It is the fact that we are to show them how to live life, how, we're, uh, how they are to live life, and how they are to be. By the way that we teach them and show them the word of God, hopefully it whets their appetite for the things of God. We should, uh, we should so lead them that they develop a hunger for God. It shouldn't be something like, oh, man, you're telling me i got to go read the Word of God? i got to go read the Bible now? Instead, you find them like in their room, and they're already reading the Word of God because, they, because you've helped whet that appetite for the Word of God. And they're over there reading it and wanting to learn about it because they're like, man, God's Word is awesome. But how many of you guys know that your child is born just like you were, and you are, you're born with a sinful nature? You're born with a sinful nature. That's why the things that you want to do, you don't do, and the things you, uh, you don't do, and because you, you should do, you don't do, right? And for those moments when you're doing something that you're not supposed to do, there's this thing, you know, there's this thing that we're supposed to show our children. It's called chastisement. What does that mean? We are to discipline them for you know, when they do things wrong. I'm not saying you're supposed to beat the child. I'm saying the fact is that you're supposed to call it, uh, to attention that what they're doing is wrong, that you are to punish them for the things that they do wrong. So here are six reasons why you should discipline your children. Because I've heard people say, you know what, I'll just put them in a corner. If your child is like me, I say like me because I still do this, is I can sit there and be, you know, in a corner and I'll find something in that corner that is interesting. And it's no longer a punishment. Because all of a sudden, I'm over there, you know, you know I got some like, sort of image or adventure in my mind and I'm going, just off of those. But the Bible tells us that we are to chastise our child. You know, that chastisement actually reduces foolishness. Do you know that? That when you discipline your child, it will reduce them being foolish. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 15 says, Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from them. You say, well, what's foolishness? Something that's not right. Right? Just so you know, the Bible says that the thought of foolishness is sin. Chastisement re, uh, rescues from judgment. Proverbs chapter 23, verses uh, 13 and 14. Withhold not correction from the child, for if thou uh, uh, beatest him with a uh, rod, he shall not die. Do you know if you give your kid a whooping, he's not going to die? We were just talking about this past weekend. I said, you know what? I said, I don't ever remember getting disciplined or a whooping with a switch. I never did. I don't remember it. You say, well, you, were you ever disciplined? Oh, yeah, I got the hand. Across the rear, and a belt. And I can remember 
the belt being pulled from my uh, from my dad's you know, uh, jeans, and you can hear every single you know uh, every single part of the belt going through every single belt loop going on. It's like rah, pow, and uh, after that, it was just Judgment Day. And then somebody said, "Well, I remember getting switches." And I said, I, "I didn't even get that. I got, I got the." You know, they said, "Oh no, I got switches and I got a whooping." And then all, all of you, some of you had creativity. Your parents had creativity in the way that they would do it. We were just kind of boring. It was just the hand across the rear. But like I said, it says what? They shall not die. If you discipline your child, if you, if you give them you know, a little swat across the rear, it is not going to kill your child. The rest part of that verse says, Thou shalt uh, beat them with, with a rod and shall deliver his soul from hell. What is he saying? That it, when you discipline your child... When you do it this, you know, this way, you may give them a little whooping. What's it going to do? It's going to cause them to go towards you know, what God wants instead of what they want to do, which is going to lead them to hell. Chastisement helps them receive wisdom. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 15, The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Practical application to this: How many times have you ever seen a mom inside of Walmart at a store that does not want to uh, does not want to correct her child, and that child literally brings that mother to shame? I have seen that mom go, "Come on, let's go, come here, whatever," and she's over there and she's just hanging her head low. And it's like you know what? One little whoosh, and it, it could change the entire situation. Like I said, I'm not advocating for people to beat their children. I'm saying you know what? Every so often, a little rap on the rear is not going to do any, uh, is not going to harm them. It's actually going to help them. You know, chastisement, also, uh, it also helps relieve anxiety. It helps relieve, you're like, how does it help relieve anxiety? Proverbs chapter 29, verse 17. Correct thy son, and he, sh- uh, and he shall give thee rest. Yea, he shall, uh, he shall give delight unto the soul. Who's the, who's the rest for? You. Because you know that the more and more your child rebels against you and rebels against you, the more anxiety builds up inside of you. Does it not? But you correct them, you discipline them, all of a sudden the anxiety goes away. Why? Because they start listening to you. They're like, oh man, mom's serious, dad's serious, I think I better listen. Chastisement helps them to reflect uh, reflect God's character. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 10 through 11. For they uh, verily for a few days chasten us after their own pleasure, but, uh, but he for our own profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening for the present uh, seem, uh, seems, seems joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. I've told you the story before that oftentimes, does a child love being punished? Kids, do you like being punished? You heard him. He said yes. But here's the thing. At that moment, they may say that they hate you, they may say, you know what, you're the worst parent, you know, you're the worst mom, you're the worst dad ever. All the, they may sit there and say all those things to you, and it's out of anger. But later on, they will thank you for it. You know why I know that? Because I did that. I told my parents that I hated them, that I cannot believe that they did, that they were the worst parents ever. When I got older, I told them, I said, thank you for doing that. And they said, you didn't hate us? And I said, yes, I did hate you at that moment. I said, but now I love you for it. Why? Because you know what? I would have been far worse if you did not do it. Chastisement reminds them that you love them. Do you know that? That when you discipline your kids, you need to hear this, that when your parents discipline you, it's because they love you. When your parents discipline you, or your, uh, your aunt and uncle, or your grandparents discipline you it's because they love you he uh, sorry, uh, proverbs chapter 13 verse 24 he that spareth the rod, uh, his rod hates his son but he that loves him chastens him but he who uh, but he that loves him what does what chastens him when your parents cha- uh, you know when your parents discipline you kids it's because they love you if they didn't love you, they'd just let you go do any old thing, and then you'd be you know, harming yourself or doing whatever. But because they love you, it's because they're trying to teach you not to do that. It's 
hopefully everything that we do in our, you know, in our life is to show our kids the Lord, right? We want our kids to be raised, you know, uh, to be good Bible-believing Christians that follow God's Word. We don't want them out there, uh, you know, getting in trouble and doing all kinds of things and being in trouble with the law, right? That's the reason why we are to parent the way that God would have us to parent. You know why? Because He created you and He created them. I think God knows how, the, uh, how your children will act, right? I mean, think about it. You have God in the Garden of Eden. He creates Adam and he creates Eve. And what do his kids do? They disobey him. And if God didn't love Adam and Eve, if God didn't love us, he wouldn't chasten us. So that's what he does. He chastens them to show them how much he loves them. I conclude with this. It is easier, it is far easier to build a child than to repair an adult. It is far easier to build a child than it is to repair an adult. When I was a youth pastor, I said I would never become a senior pastor. Do you know why? Because I could look at the parents and figure out why the child was acting the way that they were. And I could try to fix that. But I said I never wanted to be a senior pastor because then I would have to try and look for grandparents or whatever. And I said, you know what? That's just too much work. I can sit there and look and see a child and say, you know what? And look at their parents and say, you know what? They're acting just like you. How many of us have ever made the statement in here saying, I don't ever want to be like my father or I don't want to ever be like my mother? But oftentimes, you, that's exactly who you turn into. Because you know why? Because they're the ones who taught you. Whether it was for, you know, for better or for worse, right? But may the Lord help us to do everything in our power to be the best parents that we can be for his praise and his glory, right? That we follow his word, that we begin to sit there and take these godly principles this morning. And we say, you know what? I am going to parent by what the word of God says and not the way that I was taught. Because for us, especially if you were not brought up in a Christian home, you didn't have a good example about how to, how to be, you know, a, how God wanted you to be. Why? Because you were not in a Christian home. That makes sense, right? Here's my question for you this morning. How would you feel if your, tri- uh, if your child grew up to be a Christian just like you? Let me ask that question again. This is not to like sit there and be like, ooh, that's a burn. You know, pastor's trying to... No, like think about it. How would you feel if your, chi- if, your, if your child grows up to be a Christian just like you? Would you be proud? Or would you hang your head low? Would you be pleased with that? Or are there areas that, ne- uh, that need the Lord's attention? And let me tell you this. We've all made mistakes. We're not perfect. We already talked about that. There is help. There's forgiveness. There's renewal in the Lord. Some parents in this, in this room this morning need to actually apologize to their kids for living a life that's contradictory before their kids. You say, Pastor, are you telling me that I need to go apologize to my children? Yes, you do. If your conduct in the way that you lived is contrary to what the Bible says, you need to go up to them and apologize for that. So I'm not going to go out to my kid and do that. Then your child's going to keep on living the same way that they've already been showed. But if they, if they see, well, mom and dad, man, that's huge. If they see the fact that mom and dad actually apologize for when they didn't get it right, what's that going to teach them? That it's okay for them to do the same thing. That when they get things wrong, that, that it's okay for me to go mom and dad and say, you know what? I'm sorry, Mom. I'm sorry, Dad, you know, that I, I messed up. Because why? Because you showed that example to him. We all know that any change must begin with the Lord. I want to ask, Mom and Dad, is everything right in your relationship with the Lord this morning? Is everything all right in your relationship with your children? Over the next few moments... If you have any of these areas of need that I talked about, that things are not right with you, 
Bring them to the Lord right now. Why? Because the Bible says to cast all your cares, to cast all your anxieties upon him. Why? Because he cares for you. And the Lord knows that you're, uh, that you're not perfect, so why even try and act like you are? Why don't you admit it? Because he already knows that you're not perfect, right? So for the next few moments, as, uh, Tim's going to uh, play some music, and I want everyone in, uh, in this room to just begin to inspect their heart and say, Lord, am I wrong? Is there areas in my life that need improvement? Is there areas in my life that need to change? Do I need to begin to schedule in time with the Lord so that way I can study his word and, and get to know his word better? So the next few moments, I want you to begin to think about those things.